Welcome to Elam Evangelical Free Church. We're thrilled to be worshiping you with, this, with you this morning. As you find your seats, uh, we're going to start with a call to worship and with prayer. And we're going to have kind of a, an unusual call to worship in light of what is taking place in our world today. So this is a reading from Psalm 122. Pray that Jerusalem has peace. Let those who love you have rest. Let there be peace on your walls. Let there be rest on your fortifications. For the sake of my family and friends, I say, peace be with you, Jerusalem. For the sake of the Lord, our God's house, I will pray for your good. And then from Psalm 10. Arise, O Lord God. Lift up your hand. Forget not the afflicted. Why does the wicked renounce God and say in his heart, you will not call to account? But you do see... For you note mischief and vexation, that you may take it into your hands. To you the helpless commits himself. You have been the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked and evildoer. Call his wickedness to account till you find none. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations perish from his land. O Lord, you hear the desire of the afflicted. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear. Do justice to the fatherless and to the oppressed so that the man who is of the earth may strike terror no more. Dear God, Lord, we come before you uh, this day and again there is war in our world. There is conflict that has broken out in the Middle East, that has broken out in Israel. Lord, and we just pray for the peace of that city, God. We pray uh, for your church that is on both sides of, of the conflict, the Palestinian believers, the Israeli believers, that you would preserve and protect, God, that you would preserve life, that you would bring justice, that you would establish peace in this world, God. We trust you, our Prince of Peace, the one who is committed to make all things new. So as we begin our corporate worship together, we petition your goodness and your grace, and we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Please stand with us in worship. Are you hurting? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. 
Give life, you are love. Bring light to the darkness. You give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your
turn it back and you turn it back and you take the enemy before you and you turn it back and you turn it Dear God, we do celebrate that you are our victory. God, you are the one who fights our battles. You are our vindication, our defender, our hope. So that we can say that the joy of the Lord is our strength. How good it is to be your kids, the sheep of your flock. Thank you, thank you, thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, I'd like to invite up uh, Lori Cantu, our office admin, to share with us the week's announcements. Good morning. Today, it's Hootenanny Day. <laughs> so, come even if you don't have kids, come join us uh, 4 o'clock to 6 o'clock. Wear your flannel, wear your inner, channel your inner scarecrow, farmer, whatever. Come and have some good fun. Um, and then I am going to invite Karen Cowan to come up here and talk to us a little bit about Feast. Um, we do have October and November um, dates, and you can sign up for those both on Church Center. Um, the October one is in the fellowship hall. Here's Karen. Okay, I'm going to tell a little story on myself. When I was in my 20s, I was in a really good church, but I felt lonely, and I felt by myself. And I kept asking the Lord, why don't I have friends? Because all the people my age would get together, and they would go out in the evening and go places, and they never invited me. And I, kept, I asked the Lord, I said, why? And he said, are you a friend? And that's changed my whole life. Because I realized then that in order to have friends, you have to be friends. So I, he told me I had to be the one to step forward to make them move. And so when we came here to this church, I began to make some moves. Because I know, <laughs> yeah, my group, um, I know that the best way to make friends is to be one. And this is your chance. Because I've been to two of them myself. I've been able to enjoy a wonderful garden and a fire 
um, and pizza, and I've sat around a table with friends where we have discussed the word, we have discussed our life and how we got to that place, and we have been, been able to begin to become friends. So we invite you to sign up. We invite you to come and make the friends and be the friend that God has called you to be. Thank you. And next, I'm going to invite Becca Finch to come up and share a little bit about Embrace Grace. And you can also find some information, and Becky, both of them, um, on the bulletin board and on Church Center. Hello. Um, we thought we'd just give you guys a little update on how Embrace Grace is going. We had our first meeting on Tuesday, September 26th, and it went better than we could have imagined. Um, we had planned originally for two girls. <laughs> we planned for two girls to show up. Um, we ended up getting three that first night. Um, and then last Tuesday, we had four. Um, and <laughs> it was really, really awesome to see some of their stories are very eye-opening. Um, and we thought we would share a little bit about that. Um, yes, we have four women. Every story of theirs looks very different. Um, we have a girl who is fleeing from domestic violence. She is 14 weeks pregnant, um, and she has two kids already. Um, one of them is fleeing from sexual abuse, um, and this is her first baby. Um, and then last Tuesday, we had a 15-year-old girl walk through the door. Um, so they need a lot of prayer. We need a lot of prayer um, on how to navigate, <laughs> yeah, navigate and how the Lord wants us to walk with them um, and be that light for them. Um, so yeah, just a lot of prayer for these girls, a lot of prayer for us, and practical ways we could be helping is a couple of these girls already have kids, so we really do need childcare. Um, if all girls show up, um, we have the potential to have 11 kiddos every Tuesday, um, so we need at least, at least two people on Tuesdays. It doesn't have to be every Tuesday, one Tuesday is one more Tuesday covered that we didn't have originally. Um, and if childcare is not your thing, we also would love to provide a meal for these girls. Um, not only provide a meal, but we would love for you to stay through the, the meal, sit down at the table and eat with us and be in community with these girls. The ultimate goal is at the end of these 12 weeks or during these 12 weeks, if these girls decide to come through these doors, we don't want this to be a place where they're scared to come to. We want to have them think like, oh, I know some people within this body. I know people here. I'm not so scared to walk through these doors. Not so intimidating. And yes, they have me, Becky, and Linda, but we want more than that. We want you guys to be involved because um, we're really on fire for it, and we really want you guys to get to know these girls. They're really awesome. Amen. Thank you, ladies. And now, what I'm really excited about, we have a baptism today. <laughs> Scott Davidson, come on down. So this uh, is a day that we have long been praying for. This is a day that we are celebrating. Uh, Scott has been with us for uh, a number of years, and we chatted a few weeks ago after our men's group. And uh, he said, I think the Lord is inviting me deeper. Come on in. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And you can sit on the little uh, cinder block. Woo! It's brisk. <laughs> it, it was it, Sit the, facing the other way. Other way. Okay. It was warm. And we got to sit and talk. And Scott said... For him, it has not been a, a matter of belief. It has been about the, God inviting him to make this his own. So, Scott, I have a few questions for you. Is it your decision today to announce before your family and your church family that you have decided to follow Jesus? Yes. Amen. 
Have you looked to Him for the forgiveness of your sins? Through His death on the cross and through His resurrection from the grave, are you trusting that He has the power to make you new mind, body, and soul? Yes. Amen. Amen. And is it your decision today to make this your public testimony before your church that you are a member of God's family, a Christian, a follower of Jesus, no turning back? Yes. Amen. <laughs> and before we dunk you in obedience to the command of Christ, is there anything else you'd like to say today? I don't think I can right now. Okay. <laughs> no worries. Well, Scott... In the obedience to the command of Jesus, we baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And if you could cross your arms over your chest, you were buried with Christ in baptism. And you're raised to walk in newness of life. Woo. Here you go, sir. Oh. And if you could come out right here, we'll pray for you. Pat, you want to get up here? Here. Yeah. And any elders, you want to come? We're going to pray for Scott. Oh, dear God, we are so, so thrilled. Uh, God, your love is so expansive. Your welcome is so great. And we know that heaven rejoices when we choose to trust you, to receive your free gift of welcome, to receive the forgiveness of our sins, the old gone and the new come. I pray that you would just solidify this in Scott's life, that you would strengthen him, that you would grow him, that you allow him to flourish into the man you have created him to be. Protect him, lead him, guide him. Make him a light that shines in his family, in his community, in his workplace, in this world. What a joy to call him brother. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And we got a gift for you as well. Thank you, Scott. Whew. This is an extra wet sermon today. Kids, you may be dismissed to your classroom. We've, uh, we've been dunking kids lately, so it's exciting that Scott has decided to follow, but I like my, my physical dunking game is a little off when it comes to a grown man. So I didn't electrocute myself, which is a win. <laughs> so good morning. What joy we have in the Lord. What, uh, what an honor to stand witness as Scott submits his life, invests his trust in our glorious Savior. God is truly our strength. He is the one that enables us to tread on the heights. And we praise him. Well, if you have a Bible, turn to the book of 1 Kings, chapter 6. As we continue in our series, Doors in the Life of Faith. And this morning, we're going to examine two doors spoken of in Scripture. The first is probably Scripture's most elaborate door, and the second is its humblest. I'm titling today's message, Temple Doors and Closet Doors. And as we plumb the depths of this metaphor, I want us to get uh, oriented to the various component parts of a doorway. We need to recalibrate because last week we investigated what was a very odd door. A door that was actually, if you remember, a human person. Jesus in John 10 declared, I am the good shepherd and I am the door of the sheep. And he was painting for us that picture of how a shepherd who has gathered his flock into a sheepfold will in times of darkness and threat lay his own body across the opening to shield his sheep from all that might destroy them. And as the old hymn says, the good shepherd, he interposes his precious 
blood. He offers his own flesh up as a sacrifice for their protection. And it's such a beautiful image. And if you missed the message, I encourage you to go back and uh, get caught up. But this week, we're going to talk once again about actual doors, not human doors. So I want, in order for this metaphor to land with its full power, we need to give a little architecture lesson on the anatomy of a door. So, door has some different parts. We've got the two door posts. We've got the lintel, which is that horizontal beam. We've got the threshold on the bottom that keeps out uh, water and dirt. We've got the door itself. In the ancient world, it was often made up of, of planks of wood that were either bound in metal, metal or studded uh, with nails. The other thing to know is uh, in the ancient world, uh, doors didn't have hinges. Most of them opened uh, inward, and what you would do is you would have these sockets that were carved into the lintel and the threshold through which the door would pivot. And there'd be like a little protrusion. I have pictures up there for you to see of how they would swing. So that is kind of the anatomy of a doorway. And now the most glorious door in the Old Testament was the door into the Holy of Holies, the inner sanctum of God's temple. Built in ancient, the ancient city of Jerusalem, God's temple was this grand house. It was constructed by Solomon, one of Israel's greatest kings, to serve as a dwelling place for the Lord's presence. The heavens could not contain him, but God in his grace said he would live among his people. He would make himself accessible to them there in that building. And Solomon's temple, it's described in detail in 1 Kings 6 and 7. It was absolutely resplendent. We have some kind of artists' depictions of what they think it looked like. It was surrounded by these walled courtyards and that main structure, the main building. It stood 90 feet long, 30 feet wide, and 45 feet high. It was built of stone. It was roofed with wooden beams, and everything was just intricately decorated and ornamented. The interior walls and floors were lined, were made of wooden boards and then covered in gold. Inside was gold everywhere. And every piece of the architecture was just rich with symbolism. It was communicating the glory and the holiness of God. And as for the building itself, not anyone could just waltz in. Only the priests were allowed to enter through the doors. And as you passed through the building, you would move through what were essentially three chambers. You had the porch, and then you had the holy place, the outer sanctuary, where the priests did most of their kind of activities of worship on behalf of the people. And then you would see these magnificent doors behind which resided the most holy place, the, the holy of holies. And there has long been a mystery surrounding these doors. This is what we read in 1 Kings chapter 6, verses 31 and 32. For the entrance of, to the inner sanctuary, he, Solomon, made doors of olive wood, the lintel and the doorposts were five-sided. He covered the two doors of olive wood with carvings of cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers. He overlaid them with gold and spread gold on the cherubim and on the palm trees. The mystery is not in the decoration. The winged creatures, the luscious trees, the blossoming flowers, they're supposed to evoke visions of the Garden of Eden. For beyond these doors resides the paradise of God's presence, the communion for which we were created. But what has long been a source of confusion were the door frames. This is why I'm giving you a little lesson on the anatomy of a door. Um, 
what Hebrew calls the mezuzot. It says there in Hebrew, of the mezuzot, there were five. So what does that mean? You can see that the English translators are kind of struggling to explain what's going on. The, the ESV opts for the doorposts were five-sided. So it's imagining kind of a five-sided column surrounding the door. But other English translations go with completely different sort of interpretations. The King James says, And for entering the oracle, he made doors of olive tree, the lintel and the side posts, were a fifth of the part of the wall. So he's imagining the wall, and he's like, okay, the doorpost must have been this little sliver. The NIV kind of agrees, but it says, for the entrance to the inner sanctuary, he made doors out of olive wood that were one-fifth the width of the whole room, the width of the sanctuary. And then my favorite is how the RSV imagines it. From the entrance to the inner sanctuary, he made doors of olive wood. The lintel and the doorposts formed a pentagon. Which is interesting because as you look at the way the temple was completed, from the outside in, each doorway had increasingly more mezuzot, more door frames. So if you go with the RSV's reading, you're going through a triangle door and then through a square door, and then I can't make a five-sided shape with my hands, and then through a pentagon. So it's like, okay, what on earth is going on? And this would have likely remained a mystery if it had not been for an archaeological artifact that was discovered about 20 miles outside of Jerusalem. It was at the site of one of Judah's former fortified cities. And in the ruins of an ancient fortress, they, arche archaeologists unearthed this little architectural model carved from stone of a temple doorway. It was miniaturized, but it was to scale. And all of a sudden, the mystery of the mezuzot, the door frames, it was unlocked. And it turns out that one of the more recent English translations has the best take on this verse. The Common English Bible says, He made the doors of the inner sanctuary from olive wood and carved the door frames with five recesses. It's like a little mini tunnel as each door frame goes in and in and in and in. So on the outside, you had three, the outer doors to the temple, and the middle door, you had four, and then to the Holy of Holies, you had five. And this is what the archaeologists report. There's a gradual increase in the number of recessed door frames at each point of transition. To the best of our knowledge, this is unique. The entrances of pagan temples in the ancient Near East, as well as those from the Roman period, were usually adorned with one to three recessed door frames, but never more. The four and five door frames in Solomon's temple are exceptional and are distinctive to Israel's monotheistic religion. And then here's the most significant part. They say, in our view, enhancing the door frames with recesses was meant to signify the sanctity of important spaces, to convey the message that this is God's house. Do not trespass. These increasingly deep tunnels created by the recessed door frames, they were like these blinking warning lights that were growing in heat and intensity. Caution, beware, holiness ahead. The creative force behind the whole universe resides beyond these doors. He's utterly unique. He's supremely powerful. He is the source of all goodness and beauty and life. Past this point is just incomprehensible righteousness, perfect justice. The Lord burning white and pure like the sun. Beware. God's holiness is dangerous to us, not because it's bad, but because we are. And He is so, so good. We cannot endure His presence. So these doorways were to dissuade 
trespassers. But Solomon didn't just leave the symbolic doorways to communicate that. It says in verse 21, Solomon placed gold chains in front of the sanctuary to bar the way. If you were to push past the chains and go through the door, next you would encounter a four-inch thick curtain that was 30 feet tall and 30 feet wide and 30 feet long. It was woven out of blue and purple and white and scarlet threads. If you were then to push through that curtain, that veil, you would be confronted by two of these massive cherubim, 15 foot feet tall, fashioned out of solid gold with their wings touching the wall. These cherubim are not your hallmark card angels. They're the fearsome angelic beings that barred access to the tree of life after humanity's fall. They are most often depicted as having the bodies of lions, the wings of eagle, and the faces of men. And they stood sentry in the holy of holies. And between them rested the fabled Ark of the Covenant. And on top of the Ark lay the mercy seat, the throne of grace, that place of communion upon which God made Himself available to His people, upon which God was said to have rested His feet as He resided in His temple. This all reminds me of the words of Hebrews. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. I remember too one of my favorite stories from the Old Testament, the story of the prophet Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 6, He's transported in a vision, in a dream, or in reality, he's not sure which, into the Holy of Holies. And you might think that he'd be ecstatic. Wow, lucky me. I get to meet with God in his special place. But that is not his reaction. He is consumed by utter terror. He's certain that death is only a few heartbeats away. He knows that greater men have been consumed by fire, struck by leprosy just for inappropriately entering the outer sanctuary, the holy place. But now here he stands in the most holy place and he cries out, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. See, the Holy of Holies was so sacred that only the high priest was permitted access through the doors. And then only once a year on the high holiday of Yom Kippur, when he came to make atonement for the sins of his people. And at the very beginning, Moses had been clear. Because God had said to him, tell Aaron, your brother, Israel's first high priest, not to come at any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat that is on the ark so that he may not die. For I will be there. I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. But in this way, Aaron shall come into the holy place that one time a year with a bull from the herd for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen coat and he shall have the linen undergarment on his body and he shall tie the linen sash around his waist and he shall wear the linen turban. These are the holy garments. He shall bathe his body in water and then put them on. And he shall take from the congregation of the people of Israel two male goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. So even Aaron 
the original high priest of Israel is warned against passing through those sacred doors of the sanctuary. Beware, come only once a year and never come flippantly or unprepared. Come with fear and trembling. Come ritually clean. Come appropriately clothed. Come with a sacrificial substitute. Come with shed blood for the atonement of your sins. You, for you shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. They were glorious, those elaborate and gleaming temple doors that led into the very presence of the living God. But they also inspired awe and a great deal of fear and trembling. This was the most sacred place. Who could expect to meet God in His unveiled holiness and live? And I really do believe that we need all this background in order to hear the weight and the import of one of Scripture's most surprising verses from the book of Hebrews. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. With confidence, with boldness, with full assurance, let us waltz with our head held high through the outer doors, crossing the porch, passing through the doors that lead into the holy place. March past the golden lampstands and the blazing altar of incense and go to those glorious golden double doors. Undo the chain. Throw them back. Pass through the veil. Come under the shadow of the cherubim. And there, meet God in His holy presence. He's been waiting for you. He's been expecting you. And like a loving father, He wants to hear from His kids. He's eager to show kindness and to demonstrate His power to rescue and strengthen and provide in our moments of need. How did we get from woe is me, I am ruined, to hey, Papa, can we talk? I need some help. There's a long answer and a short answer. The long answer is there's an entire New Testament book, the book of Hebrews, that seeks to answer that question. Hebrews is the long answer. I recommend you read it. The short answer is Jesus. In Jesus, we found a great and a worthy high priest who can pass through the doors push past the curtain, and mediate with God on our behalf. He, he is the ideal advocate for us. He can deal gently and kindly with us because He knows our weakness. He's taken upon Himself our humanity. He's also pure enough. He's lived a morally perfect life, and that enables Him and Him alone to stand for us without quaking in the holy presence of God. Hebrews articulates it like this in Hebrews chapter 4. Since then we have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, and yet is without sin. He can deal gently with the ignorant and the wayward since he himself is beset by weakness. And it goes on in chapter 5. So also Christ did not exalt Himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by Him who said to Him, You are My Son. Today I have begotten You. 
In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. To understand that little bit, read Hebrews. We're not going to get into it today. Yet if you remember the image from the temple, we need someone that is more than a qualified, pure, properly clothed high priest. We also need a sacrificial substitute. We need shed blood to make restitution for the wrong that we've done. And as we learned last week when we looked at the Passover door, Jesus is our atoning, our all-sufficient sacrifice. We read this in Hebrews chapter 10. Starting in verse 19. Therefore, brothers and sisters... Since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that He opened for us through the curtain, that is, through His flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let me read that last part again. Draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Thank you, Scott, for being a living parable of that today. That is what we just witnessed, right? Our newborn brother with confidence has drawn near to God. And he comes not because he is worthy, but because Jesus made a way and mediated on his behalf. He comes with joy and full assurance, forgiven and made right, covered beneath Jesus' blood. Our flesh, our sin nature, has been sprinkled clean. And with Christ, we're buried in the waters of baptism and we're raised to walk in newness of life. And you see, when Jesus died on the cross for us, the Gospels report that that thick curtain in the temple tore from top to bottom. It was symbolic both of a judgment against that corrupt temple system at the time, but more importantly, it was a divine announcement that through Jesus, a way had been made for us through the curtain. In Christ, our access to God had been restored so that we could now say in truth, let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we might receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now I'm going to wrap up here shortly because it's become clear to me that we need a part two to our little temple doors and closet doors because there's a lot of ground to cover. But I at least want us to start connecting the temple doors and that torn veil with the closet door spoken of in Matthew chapter 6. Jesus instructs His disciples, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward for your Father from your Father who is in heaven. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, that they have received their reward. And then here's the key. But when you pray, 
Go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. We're going to unpack the context of that passage next week. But let me at least highlight that door. You see, privacy in the first century world in Israel was a rare commodity. Most people lived in intimate community. They lived in small towns or villages. Their houses were nestled together. As we read, their doors were almost always open. They lived as multi-generational families in these open structure homes with one big room inside. If you were an introvert, I'm sorry. The ancient world was rough. And most houses would only have one interior door, and that was the door to the storage closet. It was to keep animals and kiddos away from the foodstuffs and the goodies on which they longed to nibble. A humble pantry door. I can think of no greater contrast to the glorious doors we saw in the temple's inner sanctum. Before those doors, the high priest trembled. Before a pantry door, no one trembles. Except me when I'm sneaking a cookie that Brianna has expressly told me not to eat. I have very little self-control when it comes to gluten-free cookies. So how do the temple doors and the book of Hebrews charge to come with confidence and draw near to the throne of grace and this closet door all relate to each other? Well, my favorite, some of my favorite fiction involves doors that lead miraculously and unexpectedly to other realms. Think of the Pixar film Monsters Incorporated. Or C.S. Lewis's beloved novel, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, when a simple closet door ushers the four Pevensey children into the magical realm of Narnia. I also love uh, Neil Gaiman's weird fantasy romp, Neverwhere, where there's this mysterious young woman named Door who can make ordinary doors be transformed into portals to this uh, London below, this shadowy realm. I actually think something similar is happening here. Because of what Jesus has done for us, we can step into our closet, we can open that door, and we can step into the Holy of Holies. The very presence of the living God. He is that available. It's that immediate to us. And imagine just the shock that Jesus' first disciples would have as they hear what Jesus is saying. Go into your closet and you're in God's holy presence and He's there to meet with you. We can grow so flippant, so cavalier, so numb to the amazingness of God's grace. Jesus has secured for us incredible access. He's granted us the strength to stand when by all means we should only crumble into dust. He has paid our outstanding debts. He's clothed us in His righteousness. He's spoken up on our behalf. And He has made all the necessary introductions to reconcile us to God. Don't lose your sense of Ah, Jesus has made a way for us to be in restored, reconciled relationship with God. He's made a way for you to enter God's holy presence and to commune with Him, to receive mercy, and to find grace to help in time of need. He's transformed your ordinary closet door and it made it as, as glorious as those temple doors from the ancient world. And this is it. If you've placed your trust in Jesus, if you've accepted His forgiveness and His new life, we get to enter with full assurance of faith. Say, hey dad, 
I'm here, but I'm struggling. Make me new. Hey, Dad, I'm here, but I'm struggling. Remind me that I'm forgiven, washed clean. Hey, Dad, I'm here, and I'm rejoicing. Give me the strength to continue to follow you and to all that you've called us to do. God has given us the ability to meet with Him because of Jesus. Don't stand on the outside, look it in. With boldness and confidence, approach because Jesus has paved the way. When we know Him, the doors open and we're ushered into the very presence of God. A God who loves us and thrills to show us His mercy. So we'll stop there. Next week, we're going to pick up and explore what does it look like to have a relationship with God behind closed doors. But for now, let's boldly go before the throne of grace together. Dear God, Lord, my goodness, you remind us that of what we don't deserve, God. There is such great distance between us and you. There is so many things, our brokenness, our sin, our guilt, our shame that would keep us from you. But you refused to leave us alienated and outside. You came to make a way. You mediated for us. You paid our debts. You reconciled us to God. God, may we never forget the amazingness of Your grace. May we never walk past our closet and not remember that we have immediate access to commune with You. Make Hebrews 4.16 our actual prayer, our mantra this week, that with confidence we would come and we would meet with You and we would know Your mercy and grace in the everyday stuff of our lives. Thank You, thank You, thank You. And if there's those who have not yet walked through that door, allow them to put their trust in You and meet God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please stand with us in worship. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever sing. Worthy of every breath he could ever breathe. Live for you. Oh, we live for you, Jesus. Only there is no one like you. There is no sound. Show me who you 
I don't know about you guys, but I feel like Jesus has opened up my eyes in wonder today. He is the door that enables even the ordinary doors in our life to become portals to meeting with God. Is God far? Is He distant? No, He is right at hand. Let Jesus lead you through the door. Amen? Amen. Well, uh, thank you so much for joining with us. If you're new, I encourage you, fill out a connection card. I'll be at the Welcome Center in the back. We'd love to meet you, put a face to the name, see how we can be praying for you. If you need prayer, we have a prayer request box. You can be writing your requests. Our prayer team can be lifting you up. Also want to continue to encourage you to give faithfully as you have been to the ministry here at Elam. It lets us do things like hoot nanny and embrace grace and support our missionaries around the world. Uh, so thank you. Thank you. Go in God's grace. Go in His love with a pep in your step and the joy of the Lord in your heart. God bless. We'll see you next week, guys.